All right. Welcome to Performing Bodily Difference and Disability. Our first speaker today is Aaron Bauer, who's chair of the music department and associate professor of musicology at Muskingum University in New Concord, Ohio. She also serves as media editor for the Journal of the Society for American Music. Bauer's research examines musical relationships through systems of globalization. In particular, she explores the interconnection between genre and identity as an implication of global processes. Her current book, forthcoming in 2023 from the University of Illinois Press, addresses the worldwide spread of Texas Mexican accordion music. This book is supported by, the, by an AMS 75 pays subvention. Bauer's writing appears in Rock Music Studies, the Latin American Music Review, Latino Studies, the Journal of Music History Pedagogy, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, American Music, and a number of essay collections. Preceding her time at Muskingum, Bauer spent four years at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater and three years at Laramie County Community College in Wyoming. She holds a PhD in musicology from Claremont Graduate University. And her paper today is entitled Performing Disability Stutter Songs in the Late 20th Century. Welcome, Erin. Well, thank you. So this is this is new research. This is not uh, related in any way to to what I've done before. But I'm excited to give it to you today. As early as 1649, musical representations of stuttering entered the popular consciousness in Euro-American society. For example, Francesco Cavalli's opera Le Giosone, as Andrew Oster notes, the most frequently performed opera of the 20th or of the 17th century. Excuse me notates a pronounced and symbolically significant stutter in the vocal lines of the character Demo. When in common and equally symbolic representations of blindness, such as Wotan and Wagner's Ring Cycle of the 1800s, King Arkel and Debussy's Peleus de Melisande of 1902, and King Timur in, in Puccini's Turandot of 1926, to name a few, and physical impairment, including Alberich in Wagner's Ring, and the title character in Verdi's Rigoletto of 1851. Operatic presentations in the years following Cavalli's 17th century example include a number of characters who stutter. For example, von Curzio in Mozart's Le Nozze de Figaro of 1786, Bashek in Smetana's Bartered Bride of 1866, Janil in Offenbach's Le Conte Afman of 1881, and the title character in Britain's Billy Budd of 1924. By the early 20th century, commercial music in the United States, or Tin Pan Alley, frequently used the musical representation of disability, as Daniel Goldmark notes, quote, most notably stuttering as a popular novelty. These include Kakika Katie, written by Jeffrey O'Hara in 1918, O oh Helen, written by Chas R. McCarran and Carey Morgan in 1919, and Lilla Lillian, written by Jack C. Smith in 1923. And we can listen to just a little bit of the first of those. By the 1960s, this method of performing disability through stuttered lyrics gained a new popularity in rock songs, like The Who's My Generation of 1965, David Bowie's Changes of 1972, Elton John's Benny and the Jets from 1973, Bachman Turner Overdrive's You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet from 1974, The Knack's My Sharona from 1979, George Thorogood and the Destroyer's Bad to the Bone from 1982, and Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle from 1987. More recent examples include Joe's Stutter from 2000 and the Beastie Boys, Check It Out from 2004. As Rosemary Garland Thompson explores, the representation of disability in society, in this case stuttering, creates, quote, figures of otherness from the raw materials of bodily variation, end quote. In other words, these casual presentations of speech disfluency in popular music and elsewhere, performed primarily by and for those who do not actually stutter, structure the social organization of physical difference. They essentialize and exoticize the vocal block while reinforcing systems of power tied to ability. 
As Goldmark notes, such methods, namely the, the quote, performance of cultural others in an entertainment setting, are not unlike drag or blackface, end quote. Early representations of speech disfluency perform disability through ties to a particular character who stutters. A comic servant in, in Il Giosone and the hapless protagonist in Kakakakati, for example. However, the later rock invocations harbor few such links. Instead, the rock's daughter is variously tied to representations of drug use, science fiction, and the exoticization of a singer's own struggles with vocal fluency. This paper considers the performance of disability through musical representations of stuttering outside of specific characterizations of a person who stutters. These representations remove earlier stereotypes tied to disability, but create new problems in connections between speech and cultural, quote, abnormality. This analysis traces the inclusion of stuttering vocalizations in U.S. American popular songs of the late 20th century. It considers the compositional intent and audience-based reception of these songs. It positions them amidst earlier such representations and the scholarly discourse of disability studies to problematize the performance of disability in a seemingly unrelated context of non-narrative rock songs. Ultimately, this analysis links these performances of stuttering to continuing U.S. American exploitations of disability. It theorizes the separation of popular performance from people actually experiencing these bodily circumstances and thus exoticizing, exploitative, and counterproductive to any recent pursuit or social narrative of ability-based inclusion. Following the popularity of musical representations of stuttering in Tin Pan Alley songs of the early 20th century, the Who created one of the most prominent later depictions of vocal disfluency with the release of My Generation in 1965. Contrasting creation stories regarding the representation of stuttering in the song obscure guitarist Pete Townsend's initial reliance on the actual vocal disfluencies of blues musician John Lee Hooker, whose stuttering blues from 1953 seems to have served as the key inspiration for the vocal blocks represented in the Who's offering. Despite conflicting stories on the source of the stutter in the song by Townsend, lead singer Roger Daltrey and producer Shel Talmy, Townsend wrote the song and recorded the initial demo tracks himself. The stutter is already included on the second and third demos before Daltrey recorded his own vocals, conflicting later accounts of the compositional process. As Townsend explains in his 2012 autobiography, quote, manager Chris Stamp picked up on a stutter in my vocal in the second demo. So I played him John Lee Hooker's Stuttering Blues. Roger Daltrey had been experimenting with stuttering on stage ever since Sonny Boy Williamson Jr. had joined us on harmonica at our first marquee dates. Sonny Boy uses a stutter rhythmically when he sings. Before I completed the third demo, we experimented until the stutter became exaggerated and obvious. So first I thought that we could listen to a little bit of this Stuttering Blues by John Lee Hooker. And then moving on to these demos from, from Pete Townsend. So first, the second demo. So again, there's just an instance of the stuttering here, and this is Townsend um, completely by himself. All right, following that, we'll listen to the third demo. So this is where that stutter has been exaggerated. Again, just Pete Townsend on his own. All right, and then finally, the actual recording of My Generation from 1965, and this is now with Roger Daltrey on the lyrics.
From this telling, corroborated by extant versions of the second and third demo recordings, the vocal blocks integral to the final recording were directly influenced by musicians who struggled with speech disfluencies in real life. Townsend's use of the stutter was calculated to entertain, to provide a distinctive hook for the song and thus generate revenue through an inauthentic performance of disability. In a 2002 interview, he further describes this process, quote, I always wrote to the strengths of the band. I put in a stutter because Roger and I were both huge fans of John Lee Hooker and Johnny Cash, and both of them occasionally stuttered. In this regard, the performance of my generation falls closely in line with earlier representations of stuttering in popular song. Goldmark discusses the presentation of vocal disfluency in Tin Pan Alley songs as unremarkable novelty, a quote, incidental feature or selling point of a typical such offering that is not essential to listeners' understandings of the song's construction. A songwriting guide from 1935 similarly defines the novelty song as having a quote, rather light and happy nature, end quote. The songwriter typically waits for the chorus to invoke the stutter, adding to the artificiality of the depiction, minimizing its complexity since the speech disfluency goes away with as much ease as it appeared, and encouraging the audience to sing along, therefore, quote, shifting the song's focus from one person enacting a disability to a room full of people doing the same, end quote. As Goldmark explains, a 1918 advertisement for Kikiki Katie in the Saturday Evening Post promotes the idea that, quote, you've got to stammer the chorus because Katie's bow was tongue-tied, but that's where the fun comes in, end quote. Similarly, my generation uses the sound of the stutter, not the invocation of disability, but the sound itself as a novel and happy fetishization of a non-participating musician's actual disability. Facing an initial ban of the song by the BBC for such flippant representation deemed offensive to people who stutter, Tommy played down the true origins of the song in Townsend's mimicry of Hooker's actual stutter and characterized its inclusion instead as, quote, one of those happy accidents of the recording process. Despite the BBC's initial ban, widespread popularity for the song from pirate radio stations and record sales convinced the organization to overlook the possible offenses and allow for its mainstream dispersal. However, this initial reaction seems to have influenced the official story of the song's creation. Towson played down his reliance on Hooker's example. Instead, Daltrey claims credit for the use of stuttering vocals, asserting that it was a way to fit the lyrics to the music. Quote, I tried to follow Townsend and I stuttered on the first line. Next time I corrected it, the manager Kit Lambert popped out and said, keep it, keep that in, end quote. Yet, Daltrey gives away the aesthetic source in his next statement, quote, but it wasn't a stutter, not until Kit came out and said, keep it, keep that blues stutter. And it worked. To me, it wasn't a sign of weakness. It wasn't a slip of the tongue, end quote. Daltrey's reference to the technique as a blues stutter hints at Townsend's initial story, an aesthetic choice that was not emphatically a stutter and therefore certainly not a sign of weakness. Instead, it represents a novelty, a fetishization of the sound made popular by Hooker's actual disability, although stuttering blues is itself Hook, uh, Hooker's satirical representation of his own experiences with speech disfluency in life, but as is common rarely in song. Similarly, this description corresponds to Goldmark's analysis of early 20th century song as depicting men who stutter as, quote, effeminate and therefore weak and vulnerable, end quote. Townsend and Daltrey then both seem to take influence from earlier depictions of speech disfluency in song. Alternative explanations for the inclusion of stuttering vocals in my generation further obscure the song's origins in an appropriated representation of disability. For example, various associated parties have explained the use of the stutter as representing, as Townsend notes, quote, some pilled up mod dancing around trying to explain to you why he's such a groovy guy, but he can't because he's so stoned he can hardly talk, end quote. Daltrey corroborates this origin story in an interview with Uncut Magazine in 2001. Quote, when we were in the studio doing My Generation, Kit Lambert came up to me and said, stutter. I said, what? He said, stutter the words. It makes it sound like you're pilled, end quote. Alternatively, band members and others have suggested an origin story in an implication of the expletive in the lyrics, quote, why don't you all f -f -f fade away? As Daltrey notes, we were all in the mood for a bit of aggression. We were in the mood to tell everyone to f -f -f fade away. Finally, Daltrey has implicated his own stutter in the original inclusion of vocal disfluency on the recording. Quote, I have got a stutter. I control it much better now in 2001, but not in those days, end quote. 
This array of mythologies severed the song's initial ties to a person who stutters and the corresponding fetishization of the associated sound in favor of a series of pretexts seemingly designed to appease mainstream acceptance of the song, i.e. to remove perceived offenses against those who stutter and thus discourage the initial radio ban and any later such evaluations. Townsend and Daltrey seem to anticipate and thus curb any possible disapproval from potential audiences in the performance of disability as a mere fetishization of sound. Yet, these alternative origin stories further uh, insert further interpretive trepidations in the suggestion of a stutter as representative of drug use and lyrical aggression. They portray a vocal block as inherently other, thus constructing disability as deviant and perpetuating systems of power that place people who stutter and demonstrate other socially constructed disabilities as outside of the norms of society. Following the Who's manipulation of vocal disfluency in my generation, a number of artists recorded similar representations of disability, thus collectively building a cultural interpretation of people who stutter as, as Garland Thompson articulates, quote, the embodiment of corporeal insufficiency and deviance, and accordingly, a repository for social anxieties about vulnerability, control, and identity, end quote. For example, Elton John inserted the stutter into Benny and the Jets to depict a sci-fi rock goddess, the characteristic vocal block variously embodying the, quote, futuristic robotic theme of Benny Toppin's lyrics and the excessive drug use of the music industry. As Taupin explains, quote, the ba 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 was pure Elton. I didn't write it that way, but it was a great interpretation because the whole idea of Benny and the Jets was almost Orwellian, you know, it was supposed to be futuristic. They were supposed to be a prototypical female rock and roll band out of science fiction, automatons. So when Elton did that very hypnotic ba ba ba, it worked, end quote. And we can listen here to just a little bit of Benny and the Jets. In contrast, Bachman Turner Overdrive's You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet was initially intended as a joke, a way to make fun of the band's former manager and Bachman brother who stuttered. As Randy Bachman notes, quote, my brother Gary stuttered. We thought just for fun we'd take this song and I'd stutter and we'd send it to him. He'll have the only copy in the world of this song by BTO. However, in preparing a new album for release, Mercury Records requested the band provide an additional song. Randy Bachman agreed to include You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet if he could re-record the vocals. Fetishizing the sound of vocal disfluency, the record company instead insisted on releasing the original recording. As such, a private construction of disability directed at a family member who stuttered, a representative system of power in itself, instigated the construction of disability across a broader cultural context. According to Garland Thompson, such depictions of disability here the mimicry of a person's actual disfluency, quote, attaches meanings to bodies. Bodies considered to be superior to those characterized as disabled, here by way of a stutter, assume societal power. Outside of notions of inclusivity, the representation of disability in popular songs sets up physical impairment as a spectacle setting up hierarchical systems that attribute power to those who, as Garland Thompson notes, are, quote, sheltered in the neutral space of normalcy, end quote. And we'll listen to just a little bit of You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet. One final example of the performance of disability in 20th century song comes by way of Bad to the Bone by George Thorogood and the Destroyers. Thorogood takes direct influence for the stutter in the song from the Who's My Generation, just as the iconic riff comes directly from Muddy Waters' Hoochie Coochie Man. As Thorogood details, quote, in 1965, the Who was singing My Generation, and in the 1970s, it was BTO, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. So in the 1980s, I thought it's time for this to happen again. Someone else is going to do it if I don't, end quote. And we can listen to a little bit of Bad to the Bone as well. In 
In this regard, the Who's initial representation of Hooker's speech disfluency influences more than just the original audience's interpretation of disability. Moving through later musicians like John, BTO, and Thorogood, this representation of disability constructs a cultural understanding of bodies, which bodies conform to social expectation, which are othered as a spectacle of human experience, which hold power, and which display bodily vulnerabilities that contemporary society claims must be denied, avoided, and eliminated. The performance of vocal disfluency in popular songs from the second half of the 20th century builds on the history of such representation through time to simultaneously exaggerate and dismiss as frivolous bodily difference and to solidify systems of power that place those with such differences as outside of, quote, normal society. This form of representation is harmful and our lasting commitment to these popular songs and analogous practices challenges any meaningful effort at equity and inclusion. I thank you. I think we have maybe time for one or, or two quick questions. If you could come up to the mic so we can make sure everyone hears well. Hello. Thank you. Can you talk about the fact that they're all men? <laughs> so, yes. Um, I haven't gotten all the way into that yet, but, but one of the aspects um, is that in the realm of people who are actually diagnosed with, with a, um, a stutter, um, it tends to be overwhelmingly men. And so at least, um, you know, with those Tim Alley songs, that's part of it, right, is that the people that we're seeing who, who have a stutter um, are men. And so when we're characterizing those particular characters, they tend to be men. Um, I also think that there's something there with the blues tradition more than just John Lee Hooker. Um, and that's that connection that I'm trying to make and haven't, haven't um, completely fleshed that out yet. Um, but I think that when we look at these Tim Pan Alley songs and then think about, okay, how is the blues tradition playing into all of that? And then leading into, okay, these 1960s rock songs, I think that is such a masculine oriented tradition or set of traditions um, that that all also kind of plays into it. So that's about as far as I've gotten with that. But but yeah, I think you're right. There's something there. Go ahead. As somebody who grew up with a lot of that music, um, I have to admit that I never read it when I always read it in the uh, rhythm section. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a way to move with this power context for the stuttering. Yeah, I mean, so when I started going, so I'll, I'll say a couple of things with that. One, um, so I teach a class on music and disability, which is where this came from. Um, and I teach Daniel's article um, talking about Tin Pan Alley music. And um, so I have students that start bringing in, okay, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And my initial thought was, I don't think those songs from the 1960s, 1970s really have anything to do with an actual stutter. Um, and so I went into this thinking, okay, well, even if it doesn't, is that vocal effect of a stutter still problematic in any way? Um, which I would argue that, that, that I think that it is. Um, but when I started actually delving into it, I mean, so much of it is actually tied to people who stutter. Um, and so I think that that brings in kind of some different layers to all of this. Um, but at the same time, when I was going through, um, you know, coming at this from, a, from an angle of, I think that it is problematic in the way that it's being represented, um, I also found a lot of, of audience members um, who really connected to people that, that they themselves struggled with, with vocal dis, uh, disfluencies, um, that they actually really, really connected because they felt like these were songs that were very representative of themselves and the way that they spoke. And, and so I think that, that that's, that's interesting. Um, I, I don't know... I don't know how many people are listening to these songs and reading them actually as a stutter. Um, and I don't know if people are seeing that then as being empowering or not empowering, um, but I think that there's maybe more work to be done there to, to talk to people um, who are listening to these and how are, how are you experiencing this? And those that, that have a stutter, are you seeing this as empowering or is you seeing this as, as problematic in some way? So, um, yeah. 
or as both simultaneously. Exactly. Yeah. 